All right, this is our second session on the end time. We basically talked about, just laid the foundation last week and uh, dealt with the foundations that are incorrect and tried to bring in some light concerning the Bible. The thing is, there are several reasons why there are so many end time doctrines out there. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight is the reason why there is a pre-trib view, a mid-trib view, and a post-trib view. And the reason is they missed one thing. It's foundational. And uh, and I mentioned this last week that so many people are, are frustrated with the fact that they can't get a true or complete understanding concerning the end time because it's like standing in a room and you're wanting the combination to a lock and you've got a hundred people giving a combination and only one of them is correct. And you're, they're all screaming at the same time. And so it just gets lost. And so people are frustrated. And that's understandable. So what we're trying to do here is go back into the Word and lay the foundation the way that it's supposed to be. And in the process, we do end up dealing with doctrines that are being preached and taught that are not true. I remember a couple of years ago, well, it was actually about seven years ago, Jesse and I went to a meeting in uh, St. Louis and, uh, or out in Winsfield somewhere. And when we were there, there was this man that got up and informed us that he was one of the two witnesses. And uh, he was positive. He was it. And I mean, there were people falling out, and it, they were just all impressed. And, of course, me and Jesse, I mean, we, uh, we didn't stay long. But uh, and, I, and I remember in the years past, I know of at least two men from Kansas City who told me they were the two witnesses, and then I've heard of other stories, they're the two witnesses. And so you get all this stuff that people don't know what's true and what's not. You have men out there like Jonathan Welton who is preaching basically against the salvation message. He basically says that Christ going to the cross was actually plan B. That was never God's intention. God never had the intention to send, the, send his son to the cross and die for our sins. That was a, um, as he calls it, that was plan B because plan A didn't work with us and so he had to go figure out something else and that was his son dying on the cross. And yet, there are people following him. And, I, and you look at that and you go, how can that happen? How can that be? And the fact is, it's because there is such a shallow understanding of God's Word. When we get into the Scriptures, we realize, when you actually get into the Scriptures deeply and you really begin to connect them, you begin to understand better what the truth is. Unfortunately, what you have is I have read, I don't know how many books on the end time up until the 80s, trying to come up with a definitive understanding. And it was just more, the more I read, the more confused I got. And the reason is, is because the vast majority of what you read or you hear is you hear a scripture and then you hear 30 minutes of commentary of what they basically believe that means without really any scriptural foundation to back it up. And so what we want to do is we want to talk about some things today that deals with an issue that comes about, and, and I'm going to say it this way, there is a single word in the Old Testament that was abandoned. That in the early part of the church, after the apostles died, this one word was left out of the Scriptures. And you have to understand, as we get into one of the later lessons and we begin to talk about Babylon, you'll understand that Babylon launched a campaign against everything that was Jewish. Everything that had to do with Moses, everything that had to do with Israel, they tried to wipe it out. We look back in time, in about 167 B.C., uh, Antiochus Epiphanes went in and basically took over the temple, killed a pig on the uh, altar, and tried to eliminate everything that was written everywhere that had Jewish names or any Jewish writing. Titus did the same thing some 230 years later. So there was a there's always been this program that is backed by the dragon in the book of Revelation that was being taken, or being, how do I say this? It was being uh, presented and being operated by Babylon 
and the dragon, and later we'll see the same thing from the false prophet and the Antichrist. So we've got these problems here that we're dealing with, and one of them that we're talking about tonight has to do with this one word, and we're going to talk about that. But as we get into this, let's look at Isaiah chapter 46, verse 10. And this is what the Scripture tells us. This is God's intention from the very, very beginning. I'm going to let them catch up with me. All right, here we go. It says, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Now, this is Isaiah speaking, but it's coming from our Father. It's coming from uh, Yahweh, our God. He is speaking to us, and he is telling us that he declared or established the end from the beginning. Everything that he established from the very beginning was to go all the way out throughout eternity. So he planned it. I don't know if he did it like a business plan, wrote it out exactly, but he declared it. He spoke it into existence. And he said, this is what's going to happen. So Jonathan Welton has missed this scripture because if the end was declared from the beginning, then Christ dying on the cross was established in the very beginning also. And I want you to understand something, that in the beginning there was a principle or a formula that was established during the creation of the universe that would provide us a map or a shadow of the end time or give us an understanding in timing uh, concerning the end time. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. Scripture says, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended his work which he had made, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So God created the universe, created everything in six days. On the seventh day he rests. The Bible says that he sanctifies that seventh day. Now, what does the word sanctify mean? It means to separate. We, are sep we have been sanctified. We have been separated from the rest of the world. We are covered in the blood of Yeshua. So as we look at this, he's saying the seventh day was sanctified, separated from the rest of the week, and he tells people, we find this in Exodus chapter 20, he tells them that the seventh day is a day of rest, and everybody is to rest, not just humans, but animals. Everything that is living is to rest during that day. Exodus chapter 20, verses 8 through 11 says, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the, seventh, is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God, and in it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy, main ser thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, or in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So God is saying to, to the Hebrew children, the descendants of Abraham, through Moses, he says, the seventh day, everybody's to rest. If you have people come from another country and come into your gates, come into the city of, of Jerusalem or into the nation of Israel, they are not allowed to work on Sabbath. This is a law. Anybody that came into Israel that was non-Hebrew, was informed, if you're coming here, if you're going to do business with, he, with us, you have to adhere to our laws. Don't you think America would be better off if we had people that came here, assimilated, became part of us, and liked our laws? Well, that was a requirement in that day. God required that everybody was to rest. He says he hallowed that day. What's an interesting thing about this is this is not a coincidence. God just didn't pull this out of his hat. You know, he just didn't just, I think I'll just have a seventh day and just we'll rest that day. There was a purpose for this. 
He understood how we are made. He understood, he understood the human body and realized and knew because he created us, we need rest. So he created us that way. In 1947, I believe it was, the Navy uh, had a program, or they initiated a study. They wanted to find out what was the real or the best work-to-rest ratio. Because at that time, everybody, they rested on the seventh day. They, all the military did. And so what they did is they started trying nine days work, one day rest, ten, and so on. And when they come down to it, when it was all finished, after the study was finished, what they said was the optimum work-to-rest ratio is six days work and one day rest. In, during the uh, French Revolution, the French government passed a law that they would have to work nine or ten days, and then they would rest one day. And what happened is Napoleon Bonaparte with his military, what was happening is the people were becoming fatigued and they weren't doing very well. He wasn't doing well in battle. So what he did is he went back and he passed the law, changed the law, and said, we're going back to, I'm sure he didn't say we're going back to God's law, but he said, we're going to rest the seventh day. He realized that that was a program that worked. We see this in Scripture that apparently there is something to this because Seventh-day Ad, Seventh Adventist study was done on them some time ago. And they found out that they live an average of nine years longer than secular people and other Christians. Why is that? They keep Sabbath. It's one of the very important things. Now, here's you say, well, Christians keep Sabbath. No, they don't. Not anymore. They used to keep Sunday Sabbath, which was a, is a Catholic Sabbath. They didn't keep the scripture set, scriptural Sabbath for centuries. For nearly... 1500 years the church has been keeping a sunday sabbath or was keeping a sunday sabbath yet what day is that that's the first day of the week and god said that he had hallowed the seventh day of the week see there's something more to this he was establishing a pattern because he then later when he begins to establish his law in deuteronomy and leviticus and he gives it to Moses to give to the people. He establishes a Sabbath for the land of Israel. We find this in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 1 through 10. And it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto the Lord. Six years thou shalt sow thy field, and six years thou shalt prune thy vineyard, and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for the Lord. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which groweth of its own accord, and thy harvest that thou shalt not reap, neither the, gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you. For thee and for thy servant and for thy maid and for thy hired servant and for thy stranger that sojourneth with thee and for thy cattle and for the beasts that are in thy land shall all the increase thereof be meat. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years. And the space of seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement shall ye make the trumpet sound throughout all your land and ye shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof it shall be a jubilee unto you and ye shall return every man unto his possession and ye shall return every man unto his family now here's what god had established this is very important because he's establishing a principle here he said, you're going to start measuring time. And every seventh year is going to be a Sabbath year. During that time, you are not to plow the land. You're not to harvest. That meant that all the animals got to rest for a year. So that was probably a time that they, you know, bred their cattle and their sheep and was able to increase by numbers. And so during that time, 
you would think, well, what are they going to eat? And God had already set up something in motion, and he tells them in Leviticus chapter 25, starting in verse 20, And if you shall say, What shall we eat the seventh year? Behold, we shall not sow nor gather in our increase. Then I will command my blessing upon you in the sixth year, and that shall bring forth for three years, and ye shall sow the eighth year, and eat yet of the old fruit unto the ninth year, until her fruits come in, ye shall eat of the old store. So God's saying, here's what's going to happen. You're going to go out and plant for six years, and in the sixth year, I'm going to give you three times the normal harvest that you normally get. Whereas before, if you planted one seed, you got one plant. All right, what's going to happen now? You're going to plant one seed, you're going to get three plants. Or the, the production is going to be three times what it normally is. He tells them, this is why you'll be able to rest a whole year, because remember, Israel was an agricultural country. It wasn't industrial, you know, they didn't have um, a lot of, like you find over in uh, Asia Minor, the, the blacksmiths and the silversmiths, and they, they were there, but not to the great number that you find in other places. The vast majority of their wealth came from the agricultural um, industry that they had. And so God is telling them, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give it to you ahead of time. I'm going to provide you so that you put this in storage. And then during that seventh year, enjoy yourself. Wouldn't it be cool not to have to work for a year? Every seventh year, your boss comes to you and goes, guess what, guys? Go home. I'll see you next year. And so for the next year, you get to spend time with your family. And that's what happened for a lot of people. The problem is Israel began breaking that covenant sometime afterwards. And they began, what they did is they went ahead, they got the three-year store, they put it into the granaries or wherever the bins, wherever they were supposed to. Then on the seventh year, rather than letting the land rest, they went ahead and planted again. What they did is they violated a Sabbath day, even though it's a year long. Now, you have, this is what we're trying to get across here, is God's establishing a principle here. Seven, six days, work days, 24-hour periods, you can work. The seventh day, don't work. Seven years you can plant in the ground. You can do all those. You can harvest. Six, what did I say? Six. Thanks for this section over here. <laughs> Throw rocks at me if I miss it. So six years you can plant and harvest. The seventh year is a Sabbath. It's unto me. You're doing it in reverence of me. Why do we keep the Sabbath? Why are we supposed to keep the Sabbath? God says you keep it because I created all things in six days, and the seventh day, it's a time to honor me. Another scripture over in Exodus chapter 31, he talks about this. We don't have a scripture here. But he says when you keep Sabbath, what you're telling me is that you recognize that I am the creator of the universe. You recognize that I sanctify you and not your works. It's I that sanctifies you and not the lambs and the bulls and the goats that are killed for you. He says that's what you're doing when you're honoring Sabbath. It's a remembrance. It is for me. You are doing a service towards me. So why wouldn't we want to keep that? Why wouldn't we want to do that? But Israel, if you look at the history... They broke the seventh day Sabbath. And on the seventh day, you find this in Nehemiah, after they had come back from captivity, which we're going to talk about here a little bit. They come back from captivity, and they start going down to the mall outside the city there and start buying. And Nehemiah catches them and says, tells the, the merchant, says, if you're back here next week, I'm going to kill you. There was no law passed. There was no arbitration. They didn't sit down and discuss this. Nehemiah said, if you're here next week, I'm going to kill you. Guess how many showed up next week? I'm pretty sure it was, it was empty. But he went to them and he said, you guys, are you stupid? I don't know if that's the word he used, but it was something along that line. Didn't you learn we went into captivity for 70 years for doing the same exact thing? And you come, our fathers did that, and now you're doing the same thing? So God was saying that seventh year... You're supposed to rest. So we have this period of time of seven days, seven years, all right? So now, 
There's something else that's interesting here. We find this in Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 12 through 15. And it says, And if thy brother, a Hebrew man or a Hebrew woman, be sold unto thee and serve thee six years, then in the seventh year thou shalt let him go free from thee. And when thou sendest him out free from thee, thou shalt not let him go away empty. Thou shalt furnish him liberally out of thy flock and out of thy floor and out of the winepress of wherewith the Lord thy God hath blessed thee, thou shalt give unto him. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in the land of Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. Therefore, I command thee this thing today. I want you to remember this scripture next, the next lesson. He says, and thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and the Lord thy God redeemed thee. So he's saying every seventh year you're going to let the land lay rest and all of the people who have gone into had to become bond servants for for bad debt or whatever they're to be released and he says and you're going to see this as we get into the next lesson he said this is a shadow of redemption he says in the seventh year i'm redeeming them from the debt you're going to forgive them of that debt isn't that what Christ did for us? He redeemed us by paying the debt we owed. Now we see this in, there's, no script, there's nothing on the screen, but in 2 Kings, Elisha runs into a lady that he knew. She was the daughter-in-law of one of the priests, and her husband had died. She had two sons, and her husband had left the debt. So the creditor came and said, I'm taking your two sons. They're going to have to work off the debt of their father. So she runs to Elisha and says, this is the situation. What do we do? And he says, well, what do you have in your house? Well, I got a jar, that's, you know, of oil, that's it. And so Elisha says, go and borrow all the vessels you can, put it in your house and shut the door. And then he tells her to take out of that vessel and start pouring in, and we know the story, how she fills up all the pots. And then at the end, he tells her, now go sell the oil and... This is an interesting thing because he says, not only pay the debt, but live on the balance that's left over. There will be money left over that you're going to be able to take care of yourself and your sons. So we have this situation where God is establishing a shadow of things that are to come. And it's right off the bat. Six days he worked, the seventh day he rested. First thing he ever did. First law he basically establishes. So we look at the next scripture, or the, the next slide there. And this is what we call, I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit. It's called the Shabuah Principle, and you'll see why we talk, call it that in just a little bit. But basically, this is the law that God established. Six years you work, seventh year you don't. Then at the end of 49 years, in the 50th year, during the Day of Atonement, you're going to blow a trumpet, and all debts are to be forgiven all lands that had been st sold. Now, you have to remember, when Israel came into uh, the, the people, the Hebrew children came into the land of Israel, the land was divided up and they were all given portions. But during the time, sometimes they ran into a situation where they would sell their land for one reason or another. Maybe they wanted to, I don't know, buy a bakery or whatever. But anyway, they would sell their land. Well, at the end of that 50th year, all land that had been sold went right back to the original owners. And that was to make sure God, God was making sure that people did not lose their inheritance. That for some reason, bad judgment or whatever, they would not lose this. So that's what God has esta had established. And here's what we got, because we're going to go into a scripture here in Daniel chapter 9 in just a second. We have a problem with our end-time writers. Go ahead and go to the next slide. And I just mentioned two guys, and, and I like both of these guys. I want you to understand. I, I like uh, the vast majority of what they preach or what they believe. Uh, John Hagee has gotten a little kind of crazy with the blood moons and predicting the Lord was coming back and all that stuff, and it's kind of blown up in his face, and he's getting caught with egg on his face. But anyway... These two guys use a term when they are reading Scripture that should never be used. And the word in the Hebrew is Shabuah, 
but, and it doesn't exist anywhere else. Let's go ahead and read the scripture and we'll cover this. In Daniel 9, verse 2, and 2 through 6. In the first year of this reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the weeks. Excuse me. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the weeks the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. And I set my face unto the Lord God to seek by prayer and supplications with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. And I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. I just want to stop just for a second because this is something I think is important. This is Daniel, and he's saying something that's real important. He says, I prayed unto the Lord my God and made my confession and said, O Lord, the great and dreadful God, keeping the covenant and mercy to them who what? To them that love him and to them that keep his commandments. The reason I'm going, to, I'm going to bring this up at this point, we're going to cover it a little later, is does God love us? How do I say this? Does he love the world unconditionally? Does he make covenants with the world unconditionally? Does he give promises to the wicked? You have to ask yourself that. We're going to get into a little bit later. But Daniel says, We have sinned and committed iniquity and have done wickedly and have rebelled even by departing from thy precepts and from thy judgments. Neither have we hearkened unto thy servants, the prophets, which spake in thy name to our kings, our princes, and our fathers, and to all the people of the land. So Daniel is there. He is in Babylon. Him, some other uh, prophets, uh, we have a situation here where Daniel has been crying and praying, crying out to God, why are we here? And he gets into the scriptures, and he goes to the scriptures of Jeremiah, and he reads in there, and Jeremiah's prophesying why they're there. He's telling them, we're going into captivity. And so Daniel's reading all of this. He's going, I understood I understood by the writing of the prophet Jeremiah why we're here. We're here because we sinned. So God just didn't forgive their sin. He punished them. They went into captivity for 70 years. They're in this situation in Babylon, although it's not as bad as you might think. They have homes. It's not as bad as Egypt. They just had to leave their homes. So they're living there, they have their homes, they have their gardens, and they're surviving. And, they're, and it's not a horrible, horrible life, but it's not home. And every one of you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you've ever gone away for a while, slept in a hotel or slept in the homes of other people, when you get home, your bed is the best bed there is. All right? You're home, something happens, you relax, you feel at home. Well, they weren't. They were in this other country. And they were not home. And they, Daniel is saying, we've done this because we've not kept your laws and your commandments. Jeremiah, it's an interesting thing. He was ridiculed. I think it's on there. Is it? Anyway, Jeremiah was ridiculed by the prophets concerning the captivity. It's interesting. He, he came and he told them, he said, look, we're going to go into captivity. And the other prophets go, oh, no, 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 no. That's not what's going to happen. Everything's going to be wonderful. God's going to bring back all the vessels back from the temple. And we're going to have a wonderful time, and we're going to rebuild everything, and God's going to bless us. And Jeremiah's going, no, that's not what's going to happen. And so they take him, and they throw him in a mud pit, and they would bring him out, and they would say, now are you ready, ready to prophesy the truth? And he'd prophesy the same thing. And so what happened is Jeremiah kept warning them, you have broken his God's Sabbaths, you have worshipped idols. You have followed, fought, gone after the ways of the wicked. And they wouldn't listen. The priests and all the men of Israel, the men that were supposed to be the spiritual leaders, had abandoned everything of God's. <coughs> so Daniel's crying out. And he reads in Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11, this scripture. And it says, And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. So he's reading this. We're going to be here 70 years. Now, at this point, he's not completely understanding why. We're going to find out here just a little bit. But he understands we're going to be in captivity for 70 years. 
And we find out here in just a little bit why. why. But basically, what happened is, we're going to find this out as we read, for 490 years, the land Sabbaths had been abandoned. For 490 years out of their history, and it was longer than 490 years, they violated the land Sabbath. They violated the seventh day Sabbaths also. And so God's basically saying, look, you owe me 70 Sabbaths. So you're going into captivity, so I get them back. So let's go to Daniel chapter 9, verse 20, verse through 23, and it says, And while I was speaking and praying and confessing my sin and the, <clears throat> and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord my God for the holy mountain of my God, yea, while I was pray, speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. And he informed me and talked with me and said, O Daniel, I am now come forth to give thee skill and understanding. At the beginning of thy supplication, the, the commandment came forth, and I have come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. Daniel is given the understanding of the end time. And what's going to happen in the future concerning Israel? And God tells him as we get into this, there is a, in all the time over the next couple thousand years, not, not quite that long, there is 490 years that pertain specifically to me and my relationship with Israel. Out of this something like thousand years, he says 490 of it is specifically in relationship to me or God and the people. And this is where he starts in verse 24. He says, 70 weeks are determined upon the people and upon the holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. In Hebrew, the word Shabua means weak. So they've translated it from the Hebrew into English, which is our word weak, which doesn't mean the same thing in Hebrew. And I'll talk, talk more about that in just a second. But here's what he said. In this 70-week period, this is what's going to happen. At the end of this, he said, there's going to be a fin I'm going to finish the transgression. In other words, the revolt, the rebellion that Israel has brought against me is going to end. I'm going to make an end of all sins. I'm going to bring in everlasting righteousness. And what he's saying there is, he's referring back, and, and it appears as we look at what God's doing in his relationship with us, is he is trying to get us back to the relationship we had with him in Eden. And he's talking about a time of everlasting righteousness, where God will rule and reign and righteousness will rule. Is righteousness ruling now? <clears throat> according to certain people it is god is ruling and reigning but he's going to bring in everlasting righteousness he's going to make reconciliation for iniquity and the hebrew word there kephar means to forgive or to annul or to pardon and god made a covenant with abraham and his descendants in the land of israel that this should belong to them a thousand years generations or 10,000 generations. It was supposed to be a covenant that is perpetual forever and ever. So God is going to restore them to the original covenant where both sides, where God will not only keep his covenant, but also God's people. In Jeremiah chapter 12 and 15, it says, it shall be that after I have plucked them out, that I will return and have compassion on them and bring them back, everyone to his heritage and everyone to his land. In Jeremiah 24 and 6, I don't, you don't, yeah, it's not there. And I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. What he's saying is, at some point, I'm going to be their God, and they're going to be my people. At some point, there's going to be a relationship that is right. And he says, that I will make reconciliation for their iniquity. So they will suffer a punishment, and once that has happened, they will be reconciled in relationship back to the Father. And then the, la the other one is to seal up the vision of promise. 
prophecy. We know in the book of Revelation that there's a book that has seven seals, right? We know those seals are removed. Well, he's referencing the end time that he's going to seal it all up. It's all going to be closed up again. It's going to be done. It's going to be done with. And that happens at the very end. The last thing that he does is he anoints the most holy. That is when Christ comes down with us, his army, his kingdom is set up, and he is anointed on the throne of David in Israel. That happens at the end of the seven-year period, the beginning of the thousand-year reign. So all of what he's saying, all these things are going to happen during the, at, in this 490-year period, and at the end of the 490-year period, all of this is going to be done. At the end of the 490-year period, I am going to set up my kingdom. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, it says, And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Revelation 12 and 5 says, And she brought forth a man-child who is to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was cut up into God and to his throne. What we see being described here is that time before the thousand-year reign when Christ is set up as king and anointed king of the world, basically. And we serve with him as kings and priests. Now, let's go back to Daniel. In verse 24, he said there's going to be 70 weeks. In verse 25, he says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince, shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. Now, he just said there's going to be a period of 69 weeks. There's going to be a period of seven weeks and 62 weeks. Now, he divides this up into two periods, and there's a reason why, even though he doesn't talk about it here, we don't find this out till later in history what God was prophesying. So what happens is he says, no one understand from the going forth of the commandment, when that is given, that begins that 490-year period. And that was done by Cyrus. We'll, we'll read that scripture here. Well, it's actually in Isaiah chapter 44 and 28. It says, Thus saith, Cy saith of Cyrus, He is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be built, and to the temple thy foundation shall be laid. So God tells Daniel through the, in the angel Gabriel, so there's going to be this period of time. It's going to be 70 weeks. And when the commandment goes forth to rebuild the city and the temple and everything, that is when that 490 years begins. And it's broken up into 200. It's actually broken up into three periods. But first you have a seven-year period. Then you have or a 49-year period, excuse me, seven weeks. And then you have another period of time. So you have basically 49 years. And that's what, how long it took from the time that the commandment was given to rebuild Israel and Jerusalem. It took 49 years, and the temple was done. The walls and every, the city was not completely finished. It took longer. So there was a break in there, and then somewhere, I'm not exactly sure, it starts. But then he goes on. You know, we'll look at the scripture here in just a minute. But he, he basically goes on and talks about what happens at the end of this 69 week period. So he says here in Isaiah 44, God saying, I have a servant that's coming up. His name is Cyrus. He is going to give the commandment. He's going to restart the rebuilding. Cyrus isn't even in power. He's a nobody at this time. But later, Cyrus comes into power and he basically gives the commandment. He realizes he's the guy. It says in, we find it in Ezra chapter one, verses one and two. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith king of Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. So Cyrus comes along and he realizes 
He wasn't, not, Cyrus was not the nicest guy in the world, let me tell you. I'm not going to go into all detail about that. But he says, God has put me in this power to have this done. So I'm giving the commandment to go back and build the city. Ezra 6 and 15 says, And this house was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which was the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And Ezra, Ezra 7 and 13 says, I made a decree, I make a decree, that all they of the people of Israel and of his priests and Levites in my realm, which are minded of their own free will to go up to Jerusalem to go with thee. So Ezra gives the commandment. That starts the period. So seven weeks, six, or 49 years later, the temple is built. Now we come back, and he finishes up talking about what happens at the end of the 69th week. We find it in Daniel 9 and 26. This is after three score and two weeks. Shall the Messiah be cut off, but not for himself? And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. So he says, now at the end of that 69th week, which is about 434 years, 33, what is it, 400 and... 34, thank you. These years go by, when it's all, that's all done, it says that the Messiah is going to be cut off. And when he's cut off, he's referencing the fact that Christ is going to be crucified. That is what he's talking about. The Messiah is going to be cut off. This happens, and then he also says in the same thing, that after that, a prince will come, which is Titus. He was a prince. He was the, he later becomes emperor, but as the prince, his father, Vespasian, was the emperor of Rome. Titus comes in, brings a siege against Jerusalem, and for three and a half years, basically starves most of them to death. Comes in, destroys the city. The temple is burnt to the ground, basically, and what had happened, according to history, the temple caught fire and all the gold inlay that was in the side melted went down into the foundation and so when they got done removing all the the these big stones to get the gold there was not one stone left on another so this prophecy was fulfilled when titus came into power isaiah 53 and 7 is referencing the messiah messiah being cut off he says he was oppressed and he was afflicted yet he opened not his mouth he is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as the sheep before her shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was not crucified. It says he was not cut off, cut off for himself. What he was, who was he cut off for? For us. So he came as that lamb, that Passover lamb, and was sacrificed for our sins. So we go to Matthew chapter 24, and it says, And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him. For to show him the buildings of the temple, and Jesus said unto them, See you not all these things? Verily I say unto you, there shall not be left here one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. So Christ later talks about this, and talks about how that the city is going to be laid waste in a very short period of time, within about 40 years. So it was prophesied by Daniel. Now Christ is coming in and confirming this prophecy. The city is destroyed, he is, but he's cut off, or he's crucified, and the end of the 69th week is done. There is one week left, one seven-year period, one Shafuah that is not fulfilled. And so the temple is destroyed. Basically, Israel is taken and spread throughout the rest of the world. Israel does not become a nation again for over almost 1,900 years. Israel is scattered everywhere. She's basically looked at as being a nation that is in the ashes. She doesn't exist anymore. But God has his eye on her. Remember, he's got one week left that pertains to her. So something is going to happen in the future, he's basically letting us know, that's going to bring her back into relationship. So anyway, as we begin to look at the scriptures here, we're going to read Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, and it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. This is that one week that is left. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate, even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. He's saying there's one week left. There's one Shabuah. 
Now, this is something that we have to understand. This is very, very important. Pretty much every writer or teacher that has taught on the rapture and has taught upon the 70th week of Daniel uses the Greek word here for week, heptad. If you read their writings, they'll usually talk about there is one week or heptad. And the problem with that is you have to ask yourself, why would they do that if the word Shabuah is a Hebrew word in the first part of the book, why would you give it a Greek word? Why would you interpret it with a, into a Greek word? And here's the problem. The word Shabuah has, there is no other language that exists that has a word that is equivalent to Shabuah. Because the word Heptad simply means seven. A period of seven. It means seven days. It means whatever you want to mean, think of it to mean. It just means something that is seven equal parts. That's what heptad means. Shabuah doesn't mean that. Shabuah means seven days with a Sabbath. Shabuah means seven years with a Sabbath year. A week, in accordance to the Hebrew, is referenced Shabuah, which means to God, a week has a seventh day, that belongs to him. Right? Think about this. We are approaching the end of the, we, as we understand it, from the Garden of Eden, 6,000 years to today. We're now getting ready to approach the millennial reign. And what do we have? During that time, Christ reigns. That is his year, or his thousand years. So we have 6,000 years that have been ruled and reigned by mankind, and he's coming in, and that thousand years is a Sabbath. It is a, the seven-day Sabbath, the seven days with the seven, the seventh day being 24 hours, seven years with the seventh year being a Sabbath, and we also have this 7,000-year period with the 7,000th year being a Sabbath. It's when, it's his day. He rules and he reigns with a rod of iron from Jerusalem, right? <coughs> so here's what we have. We have basically four markers that we're going to have to look at as we get into this time of the end. But when we look at this scripture, he says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. Now, when we go back to verse 26, he's referencing a prince that will come with, that will destroy the temple. Now, some people say, well, that was Titus, so... Daniel 26 and 27 has already been fulfilled, but it hasn't been because we don't live in a land that is where God rules in all righteousness. He's not been anointed as the most holy. He's not sitting on the temple, so it hasn't been fulfilled. What we find is Titus and Antiochus Epiphanes, these two princes, these two men who basically came in and, and ransacked Israel, they were shadows of the Antichrist that is to come. Titus came in. He set it up. He, when all the people were coming into the city for Passover, once they were all in, he surrounded the city. Hundreds of thousands died. Many were taken off into captivity. But God did not set up his kingdom at that time. So when he's sitting here, when he says, and he shall confirm the covenant, he's not referencing the shadow, which is Titus, He's now jumping into the future where this seven years has not been fulfilled yet. And he says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week or seven years. So the word confirm means that he's going to make it strong. He's going to put his, whoever this guy is, he's going to put his blessing upon it. And of course, we know the covenant, he's going to confirm a covenant, which means it's a treaty or a league. It's some kind of an agreement, but it's with many nations, not just Israel. And then it says, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease the sacrifice. So apparently before the Antichrist comes to power, they start sacrificing animals again. All right. So that's going to be stopped. Then it says, and for the overspreading of abominations, the overspreading is simply means it's referencing an alcove. The Antichrist is going to put in an image in the temple. It's the image that later will speak 
and will oversee the people, and you will, ha you will not be able to buy or sell unless you take the mark. But this image is given power over the people, and it sits in the temple. That's what this is referencing. The term abominations means filth filthy idols are a detestable thing. So what he's saying is the Antichrist is going to come in. At the beginning of this week, he's going to confirm a covenant with many, and at some point, he's going to cause the sacrifice to stop and set up his own kingdom. And he's going to cause the worship of God that he established in the Old Testament, he's going to make it stop. So what we have here in this next slide is we have four mar mile markers. And what I mean by this is we have something that starts the seven-year period, we have something that ends the period, and then Christ gives us a clue what happens in the middle, and then in Daniel, which we're about to read, tells us when the sacrifice begins after the covenant is made. All right? So let's go to slide or Psalms verse 85 and 6. And I, I, I've got to go into this first because this is something that's very important. <clears throat> Israel sinned against God, and God is going to make reconciliation for what they've done. They were sent into captivity one time and one time before. And in another scripture, he says, I'm going to bring them. When they were coming back, when they got back, he says, I'm going to bring captivity upon them one more time. He talks about it in the book of Zechariah. He said, one last time they're going to go into captivity for their iniquity. Why? Because Israel still has not accepted the Son of God, right? They still haven't. And so God's going to do something to bring them to their knees where they will repent. And some people say, well, God's not that way. We watched a movie last night that I, I guess had some good points to it, but it was very disturbing in the sense that, I don't know if you saw the movie The Shack, but in this, God becomes a woman, and this, this father whose daughter died, he's going, well, what about wrath? And she goes, I don't know what you're talking about. Like, God doesn't know anything about wrath. And I thought, oh, my gosh. He just took out all the judgment and wrath that God said is going to come upon the wicked. And he said, and this, this father says, you, you punish the wicked. I don't know what you're talking about. And so my point is that is a view that the church has, that God is all loving, and he is, but he's also just, he's sovereign, he's merciful, but during the wrath of God, he says he pours out his indignation without mixture. In other words, it's full strength. You're going to get the... Whoever's left behind is going to get the concentrated version of his wrath, like the same wrath that he poured out on Sodom and Gomorrah, the same wrath that he poured out on the, on the people that were sacrificing their children in Canaan. So this is important because as we read these scriptures, you have to understand what God is trying to do is it's not just punish them, but to bring them back into correction. Do you understand? He's trying to bring them back into relationship. And in Psalms 80... Verses 5 and 6, it says, Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors. Now, this is David. He's saying, man, you, you do this, God. You make us drink our tears. We're, we're saddened because of our wickedness. Other people are looking at us. They hate us. They don't like us. So then we look at Zechariah chapter 12 and 3, and it says, And in that day... I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though all the people of the earth be gathered together against it. So there's this idea that God is love and love only and that he doesn't punish his people. And that's not true. We look at a situation here where God does what he's going to do. Exodus chapter 10, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart. See, some people, I've, I've heard people say, oh, no, 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 God didn't do that. He did not harden Moses' heart. He, ho or the, the Pharaoh's heart. He, the Pharaoh hardened his own heart. It's not what it says. God says, I have hardened his heart. And the heart of his servants, that I might show thee these my, sin, these my signs before him. I form, now, Isaiah 45 and 7. I form the light and create darkness. 
I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do these things. Deuteronomy 32 and 39. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. I kill, I make alive, I wound, and I heal. Neither is any that can deliver out of my hand. Now, what God is doing is he is bringing all these nations against Israel. If you look and listen to the United Nations, what's been going on for the last couple of years? They're, they're, they're coming against Israel. The, the Palestinians are over here bombing the city, and when they fight back, all these nations are going, well, you can't do that. Why, well, you guys are the aggressors when you defend yourselves. What has happened is, is God has turned the hearts of the other nations against Israel. They have become a burdensome stone to the rest of the world. We even have people in our government on the Democratic side that wants to give the land back to the Palestinians, take it away from Israel. Even though they claim to be Christians, even though they claim to read the scriptures, and when we know that that land belongs to Israel. So we, basically what we have here is God is going to do something to bring Israel back into relationship with him. And I believe that what's going to happen for this covenant, something's got to have, something, a war or something's got to happen for this to come about. In Ezekiel chapter 38, verses 16 and verses 23, it says, and thou shalt come up against my people of Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days, and I will bring thee against my land, that the heathen may know me. Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. He's referencing Gog and Magog. This battle has never taken place yet. And he says in Ezekiel 38, he says, I'm going to put a hook in their jaw, bring them down against Israel. But then he's going to destroy this, na this army of, of Gog and Magog. We find it in Ezekiel 38, verses 1 through 6. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog in the land of Magog, the, prince, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshech and Tubal. I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws, and I will bring thee forth in all thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Gomer and all his bands, the house of Togarma, of all the northern quarters and all his bands, and many people with thee. So what God's saying is at some point he's going to bring all these nations that are Basically, what used to be the Soviet Union and Iran and Syria are going to bring those nations against Israel, but God's going to destroy those nations so the rest of the world will know he is God. What's going to happen is this is going to turn Israel back to God because they're going to recognize this was not done just by military might. They're going to know this was God. This is the purpose that God is going to bring them down is so that we and the rest of the world will know that God is in authority, that God is in control. And Israel will recognize God is real. Because here's the problem. Anybody else been to Israel between here? What you'll find is if we visit there is that the vast majority of them are atheists. They don't believe in a God. They don't believe in their heritage. They don't believe in their, their, their father, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't believe in that. And so God is going to bring them back into reconciliation in that time. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 says this, Now the Lord had said unto Abraham, or Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house, house unto a land that I will show thee. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto thy seed, I will give thee, or give this land, and there build, excuse me, unto thy seed will I give this land, and there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And in the same day, though, this is 15 and 18, and in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Leviticus 25 and 23 says the land should not be sold permanently, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. So God has given this land to Israel. But what you find out in politics, and the reason I've read that is you have, when you walk, turn on the TV and you hear about Israel, they are wanting to turn or to give back land 
that Israel got back in the war of 1967. What had happened is, if you go back, I'm just going to kind of go through a history, and I don't know if we're going to, I'm not going to try to cover everything here. What happened is after Titus destroyed the city and the people dispatched, they went out throughout all the world. And for centuries it laid waste. They had no home. And then it's getting close to the time of the end. So God puts a, and you have to understand, Britain got control from Turkey or the Ottoman Empire over Israel. And while Britain was in charge, they had a prime minister that came into power, a guy named uh, Benjamin Disraeli, turned out to be a Jew. He gets in there and he changes the laws of the British Parliament because the British Parliament had passed laws that said Jews could not own land in Israel. So he went and changed those laws. This happened in around 1887, somewhere in that area. So now what happens is Jews from around the world start coming back to Israel. When they get there, what they find is not a land of prosperity. There's very few Arabs living there, and the ones that are are in poverty. But these Israelis show up and began to cultivate the land. They turn the desert into farmland. They turn the swamps into, into ponds where they start growing fish. And the next thing you know, Israel is flourishing. It is The rest of the world is in amazement. They're producing vegetables and fruits and things are growing and now what happens is all these starving arabs that in other countries start coming to work for the the uh, israelis they start getting jobs they come here and they start getting jealous but you got to remember something the jews had to buy the land back but originally who owned it who owned the land of israel it was god and he said these are, this is yours abraham i'm giving it to you it's yours forever it's never to be sold and the borders were bigger than what we see now. So then what happens is Israel is only allowed a certain portion. And what happens is in a period of time, these Arabs see what's happening. Israel is coming back. And it's, an, it's just an exciting thing to think about. This is a nation that no nation in the world has ever come back from extinction. None. And now Israel is coming. Their people are coming from all over the world. This nation is beginning to grow. And people are watching, and they're wanting to become basically a nation, and Britain backbites them. I'm not going to go into the whole story. But it turns out during World War II or during World War I, a, a chemist helps Britain win the war by creating a, um, an acetone, I think it is, or acetone or something like that, to make stronger bombs. The war's over quicker, and the parliament had told this guy, well, we'll give you anything you want. And they went back on their promise. So later, Israel decides we're becoming a nation. But what happens is, as they're trying to become a nation, the Holocaust breaks out. So six million Jews die. And this is being brought out into the public. And so Israel, in 1948, August of 1948, steps up and says, we are the nation of Israel. They declared their independence. And when they did, several other Arab nations began to attack them. And so they had to fight them off. In the 1950s, especially in 1956, Arabs had began, they launched a campaign against Israel, and Israel beat them. 1967, all of a sudden, all these nations, there were seven of them, and they began to broadcast that they were going to invade Israel and kill everybody, wipe them out, push them into the sea. And so Israel goes, okay, we're not waiting on this. And so they jump in their jets in the middle of the night, and go and destroy everybody's military in 24 hours. In six days, this war is over. Now, what I find fascinating is they did it in six days, and they rested the seventh. Isn't that pretty cool? So anyway, is the, all these nations learn from that and go, okay, we're not going to make that mistake again. We're not going to broadcast what we're doing. So in 1973, on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur, they attack Israel, Israel is on the edge of decimation. They are about to be destroyed. And all of a sudden, they just start coming back. Teachers are coming in, farmers, never held a gun before, and they defeat all these nations in just a matter of a very short period of time. Then in 1982, you have the, uh, another battle that ha takes place. And so there's always been these battles, and every time Israel is about to destroy the other side, the United Nations has come in and made them sign a covenant or a treaty, and the battle would end. 
because otherwise they would have wiped them complete out, completely out. Matter of fact, in the, in the 1980s, Israel had pushed Yasser Arafat, some of the younger ones aren't going to know who he was, but he was part of the Palestinian army. They had pushed them to the sea, and they were getting ready to go in and destroy them. And what happened is Russia came in with ships and got them all out of there, all the uh, Palestinians. So there's been this battle constantly going on, and peace talks, Clinton had peace talks, I mean, always, but there's never been peace. So the reason I'm bringing this up, and this is an interesting thing, I'm not sure what slide we're on, but go to slide 28. <clears throat> there's this question among many people of who owns the land. A lot of them claim the Palestinians. This is by a guy who was the PLO executive committee member, and this was in 1977. Here's what he had to say about the Palestinian question in Israel. The Palestinian people does not exist. The creation of a Palestinian state is only a means for continuing our struggle against the state of Israel for our Arab unity. In reality, today, there is no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, and Lebanese. Only for political and tactical reasons do we speak today about the existence of a Palestinian people, since Arab national interests demand that we post or position the existence of a distinct Palestinian people to oppose Zionism. For tactical reasons, Jordan, which is a sovereign state with defined borders, cannot raise claims to Haifa and Jaffa, while as a Palestinian, I can undoubtedly demand Haifa, Haifa Jaffa, Beersheba, and Jerusalem. However, the moment we reclaim our right to to all of Palestine, we will not wait even a minute to unite Palestine and Jordan. What he was saying, all these people that claim to be Palestinians, they're not a separate people. The concept came from, you have to remember, back in time, they wanted to get rid of the name Israel, and the land was changed to what? What was the name? Palestine. So well, the Arabs declared, well, we're Palestinians because this is where we live. That's where this whole thing came from. So this conflict that is building is going to lead to a covenant. So something has to happen, and there's going to be a covenant signed with Israel and many nations. Next slide. So these are the, let's see here. So we have the four markers. We talked about the first one, which is the covenant. We have the last one, which is when Christ is going to set up his kingdom. That ends the seven-year period, the week. In the middle is the abomination of desolation, which we're going to read about here in just a little bit. But in Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7, it says, Alas, for the day is great, so that none is like it, even unto the time, even the time of Jacob's trouble, trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jeremiah is prophesying of a last, a day in the end time, the last days, called a time of trouble like never before. That means a time of trouble that is going to be worse than the Holocaust, where six million Jews died. This is going to be worse. It's called Jacob's trouble, or Israel's trouble. Now, we go down to Matthew chapter 24 and 15. He's, Christ references this when he says, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. So he's saying here, when you see the abomination spoken of by Daniel, he said, when you see this, listen and understand. Whosoever reads this, understand. This wasn't given to just Israel. This was given to everybody in the world. Whoso, I've said this before, we're all whosos. If we've read it, we're supposed to read this and understand it. So what he's saying is, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place when he goes into the temple. So we have on that slide back there a little bit ago, we had in the middle the abomination of desolation. It's when the Antichrist comes in and has power. We have to understand that the Antichrist has power for three and a half years. That's what Scripture says, 1,260 days. His, or his ministry, whatever you want to call it, ends at the end of the seven-year period when Christ 
comes back and kills him, throws him into the pit of hell. And that happens at the end of the seven. So the Antichrist comes in at the middle, sets himself up as God, and rules and reigns in Israel there for three and a half years. So let's go back and read what Christ is referencing in Daniel 9 and 27. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, this is what Christ is referencing, in the middle of the seven-year period, in the middle of the Shabuah, he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations. He shall make it desolate even until the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So now let's go down back a little further in Matthew chapter 24, verse 15. Go read on a little past. When you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. All right, this is what we learn from this. The great tribulation is not seven years long. It begins in the middle of the seven-year period when the Antichrist comes to power. It lasts for three and a half years, the great tribulation period. The rest of the scripture says, And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. In other words, when the Antichrist comes in and he has scattered Israel and he's put them in camps and killed them and they're all taken out of Israel because that's what's apparently going to happen, then the end comes. Revelation 12 and 1 says, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed, a woman clothed with the sun, and moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Verses 5 and 6 says, And she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. Twelve hundred and sixty days is when the Israel, the 144,000, are hidden during that period of time. So what we have during that second half is a lot going on. We have the Antichrist in power. We have him in authority. We have, during that time, the Great Tribulation. We have all these things that are happening. It is when the seals begin to be removed. We'll talk about that later. So we go to Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is during his rule and his reign. Revelation 13, 7 and 8 says, And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power is given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. So basically everybody in the world is going to follow after the Antichrist. They're going to worship him. They're going to take his name. They're going to take his mark because their names haven't been written. or We know that their names have not been written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So they're going to go ahead and follow him. They're not going to know the truth. He also is going to do some other things, Revelation 13, 16, and 17. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand and in their foreheads, that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So the Antichrist rules for three and a half years. Revelation 13 and 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. So this is basically what we have. We go to the, the next slide. And again, what we have is the sacrifice is stopped in the middle. The abomination of desolation is when the Antichrist comes in and causes the sacrifice to be desolate. The temple is now desolate of worship. And the Antichrist sets himself up as God. And the false prophet is there passing laws upon the rest of the world, and they have set up the image. So now we're going to look at
let's see here. Go ahead. Uh, I'm trying to. I think I'm going to try to break this down a little quick if I can. All right, I'm going to go ahead and read this. Daniel chapter 8, verses 10 through 14. This is referencing the Antichrist. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and staffed upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away, and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. And a host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint saying, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to, tr to be trodden under foot? And he said unto me, Two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now I want you to, if you would, go back to the previous slide. There's two men talking, two angels talking, and one says, well, how long is it going to be to the end? You know, referencing the sacrifice, the abomination of desolation, to the end. And the other guy says it's 2,300 days. Now, if you add this up, you have 1,260 days on one side, which is three and a half years. You have 1,260 days on the other side, which comes out to about, what, 2,520 days, something like that. All right? 2,520 days. So he's saying that there is a period there of 2,300 days. What he's saying is the sacrifice begins 2,300 days before the very begin, begin or the very ending of the seven-year period. What's interesting is, as we get into this, you're going to understand that the covenant is signed around the Feast of Tabernacles, Feast of Trumpets. Six months later, or 220 days later, is Passover. So they're going to begin the sacrifice. And I don't have time to get into it really a lot, but basically they're going to start that sacrifice in Passover. The covenant will be made during the Feast of Trumpets, Feast of Tabernacles. Sacrifice begins, period of time la later, three years later, Antichrist comes into power and causes the sacrifice to end. Now, one of the things that we don't see a lot of times in the end time when it's being talked about is the 12th chapter of Daniel because there's some very important information here. Remember the scripture says, For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time nor ever shall be. So we're referencing the very last days. Okay, go to slide 41. We're going to go to Jan Daniel chapter 12 verse 1. And it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the people, the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. So what we have here is, He's saying here at the, at the end, he says, we're talking about the end time. He says, we're going to be, there's going to be a time of trouble like never before. So we know we're talking about that during that seven-year period. And he says also that the people will be delivered. There's going to be resurrections. There's going to be a resurrection of the just, and there'll be a rapture. We'll be caught up into the heavens. And then later at some time, there's going to be a resurrection of the unjust, right? So he's just kind of giving an overview here. So let's go to verse it says, But thou, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book even to the time of the end. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Now, he has a book. What has happened is Daniel has been given a book. He's got a book here in his hand. He's look, looking at it, and it has all these things that are going to happen. It's the end time. He's, he's just been told. And he says, Shut up the words and seal the book, even to the time of the end. This book is going to stay sealed till the time of the end. What book is he holding? It's the book that has the seals on it in the book of Revelation. The book that we later see that contains what he just read, all this horrible thing that concerns, concerns the, the time of the end, the great trouble, is in this book. And he says, shut the book and seal it. 
So Daniel, we, does it say it here, but we know that Daniel apparently puts seven seals on this book, and it has to stay sealed until the time of the end begins. See, now we all t understand that we are in the time of the end, the last days, right? That's how we kind of look at things. The reality is there is a specific period of time. There is a seven-year period and then even a smaller period, which is called the time of the end. And this is what the Scripture tells us. Daniel 12 and 9 says, And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Now we see this in Revelation chapter 5, verse 1, that book. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. So here's basically the next slide. We have this graph. And what you have here at the top where it says book stays sealed, the book is sealed right now, right? And the book, the seal that's saying the seals stay on there. So not one seal can be removed till the time of the end begins. Correct? Let's make sure we've got that. So they're all seven seals are on there. And so what he's saying is at the, abomin at the time of the abomination of desolation in the middle, in a time of trouble, when it starts, it coincides with the removal of these seals. So... The time of the end, and I'll show you here in a minute, is 1260 days. Let's go to Daniel chapter 12, verses 5 and 7. Finish reading what we've started. Then I, Daniel, looked and beheld, or behold, there stood other two, the one on this side of the bank of the river, and the other on that side of the bank of the river. And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? What wonders are they talking about? They're talking about the wonders that Daniel was reading in the book. That's what it's referencing. And the things that are associated with the book. So it says, And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever, that it shall be for a time, times, and a half time. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the people, all these things shall be finished. He's saying everything with that book, the removing of the seals, the book opening, the writings and the prophecies in the book are going to be finished during a period called a time, times and a half a time. We know that there's three and a half years, right? Time equals one year. Times, plural, equals two years. And then we have a half a time, which is half a year. So we have three and a half years, which is 1,260 days. Again, corresponds with the time that the 144,000 Jews are hidden in the wilderness corresponds with the rule of the Antichrist for 1,260 days. So all of these things are happening during that time. Now let's go to Daniel 12, verses 8 and 11, through 11. And I heard, but I understood not. Then said I, O Lord, what shall be, what shall be the end? He's already asked, how long is it going to be to the end, right? And he's told 1,260 days, or three and a half years, or a time, times and a half. Then he says, and I heard and I understand not, but then said I, O Lord, what shall be the end? What is going to be the end? And he said, Go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. Many shall be purified and made white and tried, but the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. From the time the daily sacrifice shall be taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. So there's an extra 30-day period in there, and we're not going to get into that right at this point here, but it references things that, there's other things that are going on. There's going to be a cleansing of the area. So anyway, let's go to the final, to the, the graph here, the final slide. This is what God is telling us in all these scriptures. There's a seven-year period. It's the Shabuah of God, right? It's the 70th week. It belongs to him. It is the time where the end, begin, end begins and ends. It's the time of the end. It begin, the time of the end begins, begins with the Antichrist coming into power. The time of the end, he's told. How long is the time of the end? He says 1260 days. When will, what will be the end? It says when everything is consummated, when, from the time that the Antichrist is setting up his power and he's destroyed. That is the time of the end. It is there that we see in the next session 
we find out more about that book. We find out how it relates to that second half. So in closing, here's the importance of this message, is that the Shabuah principle is very simple. Six parts of time always belongs to man. God gives us that. The seventh part belongs to God. That's his. We call it the Lord's Day, the day of the Lord. It's the year of the redeemed. Because later, as we get into this, you're going to find out there are terms that are interchangeable that is referencing a period of time in this seven-year period. So we have, now, in closing, this is what we know. We have a seven-year period in there, right? It begins with a covenant with the Antichrist makes with many nations. The sacrifice begins at some point, and then in the middle of that covenant of the seven-year period, the Antichrist goes into the temple and sets himself up. This corresponds with Zechariah chapter 14. He sets himself up as king, declares himself that he is God on earth. He then wages war against Israel. The Antichrist comes, or the false prophet comes into power with the Antichrist and begins to build the, builds the image, passes laws you can't buy or sell. And during that time, that three and a half years, is the great tribulation. It is called, the, it is called Jacob's trouble. It's the time when Israel suffers greater than it ever has before. And then at the end of the seven-year period, God, re the Bible tells us, as we get into this later, that he brings all of his people from the four, ca four winds of the earth, brings them back into Israel, and sets up his kingdom. So in that seven-year period, there is a one-year period that belongs to God, right? It's a Sabbath year. So what would God do during that Sabbath year if it belongs to him? Well, that's what we're going to talk about in the next session. We're going to get into that deeper. I'm sorry, it kind of ran a little long because there's so much to this. But we have to understand this, this concept of the Shabuah, and we have to use that term and not heptad. We have to understand God speaks a specific way, and we're not to add to it or take away from it, even by accident. And I know that there, we, we, you know, we've all done, said things accidentally, but it still doesn't mean that it doesn't deceive people. And so we have to bring correction back to God's word, and that's what we're trying to do. So in closing, we'll open up for questions.